Nancy was right about one thing. Definitely old. <laughs> So this is my, I think the second time I was able to give a presentation. So um, I will try to communicate. The, the original topic was guru-disciple relationship. That was what started out to be the idea of this presentation. But then um, there were so many presenters or persons who were giving seminars that each one of us was allowed only one session. So I had to really bring it down to try to bring it to the essence. So I chose this particular prayer by Srila Narottam Das Thakur as pretty much the essential philosophical uh, understanding that is the embodiment of deep devotional service to the spiritual master. Written by, of course, Narutam Das Thakur, one of the most exalted, uh, we say, not associates of Lord Chaitanya, but one who presented Lord Chaitanya's teachings in the most powerful and most revolutionary way. Srila Prabhupada did something, of course he did many things that were different, and uh, what we say revolutionary, outside of the traditional norms of spiritual masters' teachings and presentations. And one thing that he did, which was really quite revolutionary, is that he had a guru puja every day in our temples. We still do that. Uh, normally, and traditionally, the guru is worshipped on his appearance day once a year. But Srila Prabhupada, knowing that Westerners, of course he started his movement here in America, were somewhat unaware, someone in the darkness of really what it mean, what is a spiritual master and what does it mean to become a disciple and how we should understand our relationship with the spiritual master. So to help us, which he did in so many ways through his teachings and through his, his example, he gave us this Guru Puja every day to help us become really, really fixed on his lotus feet, to really become attached to Srila Prabhupada in the proper way. And so this particular prayer, written by Narottam Das, das Thakur, as Srila Prabhupada has said, is the perfection of all spiritual philosophical teachings about the relationships between the spiritual master and the disciple. Uh, Narottam Das Thakur is unique in his um, presenting philosophy within song, within bhajan. He was able to bring out the essential teachings in such a powerful way that there was, oh, everything was inclusive. To write songs, to write poetry, and yet keep the philosophical teachings in essence and present it to, to their conclusion was really a, a deep, deep uh, spiritual trait that is very rare. But uh, Narottam Das Thakur had that deep devotion and that, of course, great learning. So Prabhupada liked this prayer very much and he introduced this. So I hope to go over this prayer in such a way that when you sing this prayer every day, 
in your temples or in your homes or whenever, you can enter into the spirit of this prayer because as we enter into the spirit of these words, it really helps us to understand deeper what is our relationship with the spiritual master. With that introduction, begin. Shri Guru Charana Padma, Shri Guru Charana Padma Keva Bhakati Sadma, Bandho Muhi Sarvadhana Mate. Let me just backtrack a little bit. The relationship between the guru and the disciple is really the fundamental basis of all our spiritual practice, our understanding of the science of spirituality, and ultimately our uh, advancement. Everything evolves around that. The spiritual master is the embodiment of Krishna. He is non-different than Krishna in the sense that he is not Krishna, but as Prabhupada said, you should see him like Krishna. In other words, the worship of the spiritual master should be on the same level as if you were worshiping Krishna. What does that mean? It means that Krishna appears as the spiritual master to accept service on behalf of himself. There is guru who is served, and Guru who is serving. I mean, I'm sorry. Lord who is served and Lord who is serving. So Lord who is serving is actually the spiritual master, which is the not a representative of the Lord. And he is one of the principles of the absolute truth. So to approach the spiritual master, really, and to receive instructions is like to approach the Lord directly like that. So this particular prayer helps us to go deeper into what is a spiritual master. And in this case we can meditate on Srila Prabhupada because when we think of perfection we can understand unanimously that Srila Prabhupada was an embodiment of perfection in all aspects of the spiritual master. Sri Guru means a spiritual master with or opulences. She represents opulences. So he is fully embodied with all the opulences of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Just to give a little nice story about Srila Prabhupada. I really like to talk about Prabhupada because not for two reasons. One, um, I like it. <laughs> and I feel most happy because it seems like Everything that I represent in terms of my own, you know, preaching or whatever, is really a reflection of what Prabhupada's mercy. And the second thing is I feel really strongly, and this was discussed just recently in a meeting we had in Ujjain, that devotees should keep Prabhupada's spirit alive through reading his books, through uh, practicing the process of devotional service, but more so by hearing about the person Prabhupada, by reading the uh, pastimes of Prabhupada, by discussing Prabhupada, not only as a spiritual master, but as an individual who came at a particular time as an empowered personality to spread Krishna consciousness, the uniqueness of Srila Prabhupada. Uh, some people think, mistakenly, and we find that even in our temples that I go to, that people think that especially guests, and even new devotees, that Prabhupada was a great soul. And that's true, but that's really not enough of the definition to describe Srila Prabhupada's um, uh, mission, or his personality, his spiritual empowerment. He was directly empowered by, by the Lord to spread Krishna consciousness. Uh, Babananda spoke one time about a few, three or four years ago in Mayapur. And he was describing a particular story, pastime, that he had with Prabhupada. He used to massage Srila Prabhupada. And Prabhupada would sometimes just talk. And while the massage was going on, he would reflect, he would say anything. He would talk about preaching, or he just would bring, bring up something that was interesting. So while the massage was going on, Prabhupada said, Krishna said to me, 
you go to the material world and you preach. And I said to Krishna, the material world, it, it is a horrible place. It's a horrible <laughs> place. I mean, imagine being situated in the spiritual world and have to come here. <laughs> horrible place. And Krishna said, no, you go, you write some books, and I'll protect you. And so Krishna said, I went. <laughs> Krishna wanted me to come. I didn't want to come. But because Krishna wanted me to come, I came. So we can understand a little bit from that, you know, what was Srila Prabhupada's position. Another time he said, my personal bodily color in the spiritual world is reddish gold. Uh, reddish gold, that's interesting, because if you see the Panchatattva, especially the Panchatattva in Mayapur, and there is, you know, Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Lord Nityananda, Advaita, Gadara, Sri Vas. Lord Chaitanya is golden, beautiful, pure golden, and Gadara is also the same color. But Nityananda, is, he's gold, but he's got a reddish tint to it. So Prabhupada sort of indicated he's coming from the Tattva, or from the, when we say, the associates of Lord Nityananda, which is Lord Nityananda is the original spiritual master like that. So to go on to the prayer, the, the spiritual master is the embodiment of all opulence. Shri Guru Charana Padma. Padma means lotus feet. That the lotus feet of the spiritual master are the embodiment of pure devotional service. When one takes shelter of the lotus feet of the spiritual master, one is taking shelter of the process of pure devotional service. When we speak of devotional service, we have to understand devotional service means pure devotional service. And just like there is air, but they can become polluted. Therefore, it's not pure air. It's not very really desirable. Or food, when it becomes added with chemicals or pesticides, for some other ingredient that is unnatural to its nature, it is no longer pure. Water the same way. So devotional service really is the natural constitutional position, pure devotional service, of all living entities. We heard this morning, Nitya Siddha Krishna Prema, Saruka Bona Aishravanadi Siddhi Chitti Kodiya Yudha. In the heart of all living entities, there is pure love for Krishna. It doesn't have to be brought in from another place. It is our nature to love Krishna ecstatically. That is our constitutional makeup. And therefore, pure devotional service is the constitutional position of the living entity. And therefore, a real spiritual master, the one who is empowered by the Lord, teaches only pure devotional service. To take shelter of the lotus feet of the spiritual master means to take shelter of the process of pure devotional service. We, we, we seek purity in what we want and what we do. We're not so much satisfied by something that is less than ideal. Uh, of course, pure devotional service is something we, can, we have to strive to attain, but that is the position of the spiritual master. He's giving pure devotional service. Shri Guru Charana Padma. Padma means lotus feet. Charana means to take shelter of those lotus feet and engage, be engaged in pure devotional service. Kevala Bhakti is also pure devotional service. Sadma Bando Muhi Sarva Dana Mateya. I offer my respects. I bow down to his lotus feet with great order. When we offer our obeisances, Krishna says in Gita, Manmana Baba Mad Bhakto Mamyaji Mam Namaskuru. He says that twice in two different places. It's interesting. In the ninth chapter and in the eighteenth chapter, the same two lines are repeated in the first part of the verse to indicate that this verse is what is called Paribhasa Sutra. What is a Paribhasa Sutra? It's a verse that summarizes all other principles of devotional service into a verse. 
It is the essential teachings of the scripture. So in that teaching of Bhagavad Gita, Krishna sums everything up. And what is devotional service? Four things. Think of me. He says, always think of me. Become my devotee. Worship me and offer your obeisances to me. Offer your homage to me. So I bow down to the lotus feet of the spiritual master with great own reverence. So paying obeisances is actually one of the four essential principles of devotional practice. It should be done in that mood of devotion. Sometimes, not sometimes, a lot of times we, we just do it. Prabhupada was very, uh, what we say, aware that, you know, we didn't really know how to pay obeisances. You know. um, Shruti Kirti Prabhu, Prabhupada's personal servant, he would um, come in and out in order to serve Prabhupada. And he describes in one incident where other devotees were coming to do personal service for Prabhupada. And one devotee came in and it, it, he explains that each time one would come into the room where Srila Prabhupada was, they would pay their full obeisances. The Maun Vishnu Padaya, Krishna Vistaya Bhutale, Srimati Bhakti Vedanta Swami, the whole pranam prayers. And then get up and do your service. And then when you leave, you do the same thing again. So one, in one incident, this one devotee came, he just put his head on the floor, and then got up, and then stopped, Prabhupada stopped him. He said, what is this hatchet? When the hatchet goes, ch -ch -ch, ch -ch, ch -ch, ch -ch. just putting the head to the floor and getting up. It's more like a ritual. It looks good. It seems like it's, you can get more things done. You don't waste time that way. But that's not the idea. Paying obeisances actually is a very deep uh, spiritual act that should be done in the proper way. So this verse, or this part, I, pay, I bow down to the lotus feet of the spiritual master with great awe and reverence. It is a very important devotional act to pay one's obeisances. That's the next line. By his grace, one can cross the ocean of material existence and obtain the mercy of Krishna. By His grace. What is the spiritual master offering? He's not offering some material benediction. There's one story where um, Prabhupada was in, I believe it was in India, somewhere in India, and he was preaching. And he had finished his lecture, and uh, he was walking towards the door. And one very, very respectable man, along with his wife, well-dressed, very cultured, came up to Srila Prabhupada and said, Swamiji, give me your blessings. And Prabhupada said, you don't want my blessings. <laughs> and Prabhupada attempted to walk. The man again came in front of him, Swamiji, no, please give me your blessings. Prabhupada said, you don't want my blessings. So, yeah, somehow he could see that this person didn't want the real blessing. So again, he starts to come and says, No, no, Swamiji, please, please give me your blessing. Prabhupada says, Okay, I bless you. Your material life is finished. <laughs> and uh, he just drifted into the crowd, and that was the end. So sometimes we don't want the blessings. <laughs> That is the real blessing of this of the spirit of spiritual master to free us from this entanglement of material energy. In whatever way that can be done, that is his mercy. So this that nine really means he takes you across the ocean of material existence. He frees you from your material attachments. And he attaches you, Krishna Prapti. Krishna Prapti Hoy Yana Hoy Te. He gives you the mercy, he takes you to the lotus feet of the Supreme Personality of God. He engages you in pure devotional service. So this is the first couplet of that particular prayer. 
that the spiritual master is the embodiment of all of Krishna's full mercy. He can, it's not that the spiritual master knows everything. One time, someone asked Prabhupada, Prabhupada, do you know everything? Prabhupada said, I'm not Krishna. But I know what Krishna wants me to know. Therefore, the spiritual master, in his relationship with his disciple, or one who approaches in that way, knows exactly what Krishna is telling him in order to help that person make advancement on the path of spiritual progress. So in that way, the spiritual master is fully cognizant of whatever is required for the disciple to move forward in the path. Sometimes we have a hard time with that. You know, we get an instruction from the spiritual master. We know that instruction is there for us. And it becomes what we say, um, a feature of our, what we say, uh, an inability to, um, to practice. So what do you do when you get an instruction that's difficult? Or you might say, very difficult to execute. Or seemingly like that. One should humbly, but in a detached way, inquire from the spiritual master how to execute the instruction. And also, if one feels, one can say, can you give me something different? <laughs> and if the spiritual master feels that that is required, then he can do that. But usually, the best thing is to try to understand deeper what it requires to carry out the instructions. It's the relationship between the spiritual master and the disciple is like a relationship between a father and a son, a father and a mother. I mean, I'm sorry, a father and a daughter. It's, it is family, it is deep, it is affectionate. It is based on giving that same love that Krishna is trying to give to you through the process of devotional service, the spiritual master. Therefore, the spiritual master has genuine affection for his disciple, trying to help them move forward. And this, this disciple is attached to the lotus feet of the spiritual master by following the instructions very carefully. Guru Mukha Padma Bhakya Chitete Kuriya Akya. Ah, beautiful verse. That uh, my only my only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from his lotus mouth. So here is the essence of devotional service, to constantly be in contact with the words of the spiritual master, to hear regularly. Just like in order to nourish the body, we have to take care of the body. We have to eat, we have to rest it, give it whatever it needs. If we neglect our bodily maintenance, then it becomes hard to fulfill our activities in life. So the body requires ne regular necessary maintenance. In the same way, the soul needs that regularly. So therefore, what is that nourishment? The spiritual master's words. Simply the words alone of the spiritual master can purify the consciousness of the disciple and uh, awaken that disciple to engage in devotional service. Therefore, one should hear. And this line also has another meaning, that I don't want to hear anything else. The spiritual master's words are my only food stuff. Not only is my life and soul, but that is my only food. That's where I get my nourishment. That's where I get my happiness. That's where I get my relationship with Krishna. Regular hearing of the words of the spiritual master. So this is a function of devotional service that is not optional. If we really want to, what we say, go deeper into our practice of Krishna consciousness, we have to hear regularly, 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 regularly. And in the second part, attainment to his lotus feet is the perfection that fulfills all, this, I'm sorry, my only wish is to have my consciousness purified by the words emanating from his lotus mouth. Prabhupada said, this, is, this one has to be fixed on this point, that this is my determination. There is no other determination. 
And this alone, this alone is the feature of success in devotional service. It may seem like an act of simply the hearing, but it is explained that the words of the spiritual master are so powerful and so pure that it can immediately awaken one's love for Krishna, simply by the process of hearing. Prabhupada talks about himself in this regard. Um, he says that, I should put my glasses on. Now I can see you all better. Okay. I can't read with them on and I can't see with them off. So it's a problem, you know. In material life, nothing ever works out just the way you want it. <laughs> Prabhupada talks about himself in this regard, that um, there's a verse in the Bhagavad Gita, second chapter, verse number 41. And that those who are on this path of devotional service are resolute in purpose, and their aim is one, a Krishna speaking, he says, O oh, Arjuna, beloved child of the Kurus, those whose intelligence are irresolute, then their intelligence is, those who are irresolute, their intelligence is many branches. They're in different directions at the same time. So Prabhupada said, this is my success in spreading Krishna consciousness. Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur speaks about this verse in such a way that he explains the meaning that whether it's easy or difficult to carry out the instructions of the spiritual master, that's not the point. That has no consideration in the execution of the instruction. It's not whether it's easy or difficult. That's not, Prabhupada said, I meditated on this verse and therefore I was successful in executing Krishna. I never considered whether it was easy or difficult, impossible or possible. It was the instructions of my spiritual master to come to the Western world to, on behalf of Lord Chaitanya and spread the Sankirtan movement. And therefore, I only thought on how to do it, not whether I could not do it or do it not do it, only how to do it. So this, this line really illustrates that principle that one should meditate on the instructions of the spiritual master as one's life and soul and figure out how best to execute it. That is one's success in spiritual life. Shri Guru Charanerati they say Uttamagati Ye Prasadi Purve Sarva As The next word. Attachment to his lotus feet is the perfection that fulfills all desires. Attachment to the lotus feet of the spiritual master, again, comes back to the same simple principle, attachment to the instructions of the spiritual master. Sometimes, devotees think, I have so many other activities in my life that require uh, attention, require plan making, and require some ability to carry out some expertise in these areas. But this line explains that all of one's desires, not just spiritual, but all of one's desires can be fulfilled. All of one's goals in life are fulfilled through the process of devotional service. And how does that happen? How is it possible? We might also think in terms of, you know, maintaining family, uh, taking care of our responsibilities with occupation, and whatever else we do that is not what we say defined as direct devotional service. But because we are, in, we are a devotee engaged in, in the process of devotional service, everything that we do is connected to the process of bhakti. Therefore, by executing spiritual life, and becoming fixed on the lotus feet of the spiritual master that extends itself out to all aspects of our existence. We don't have to make separate arrangements for anything. 
Well, you might say, well, that's impractical. <laughs> it's not possible. But watch it happen. As we please the spiritual master through the process of devotional service, then whatever else we are trying to do in order to live in this world, that mercy extends itself to whatever else we do. And therefore, there's two ways to, to, there's two ways to fulfill a desire. One is you get what you want. You go for something, you get it. And the other way is you get something better and you no longer want it. You lose your attraction, you lose your attachment, you lose your enthusiasm for something, what we say, material, or whatever it is. Therefore, simply by executing devotional service, everything else falls in place nicely. That takes faith. Would you like to hear a story? Yes. You're not going to like this story. <laughs> These sannyasis are so impractical. They don't make sense. They don't know what it's like to be a householder and have to struggle in this world. They're just too philosophical. They're not. But I'll tell you the story anyway. Sri Vasna Kaur, one of the personal associates, Panchitattva, Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya came up to him and said, Sri you know, you don't work. I mean, you don't have an occupation. You got a big family. How do you maintain him? What do you do? You don't do anything. Srivast went. That was his answer. Lord Chaitanya said, Well, what does that mean? And Srivast explained. He said, One day, if Krishna doesn't feed me, two days if he doesn't provide food, three days if he doesn't provide, then I will drown myself in the Ganges. Lord Chaitanya just roared in ecstasy. He was so happy. Srivas, you have understood. Even if the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, has to go around begging for food, there will always be food in your house. Because he had that faith. I told you you wouldn't like this. <laughs> he had that faith that simply by performing devotional service, Krishna would provide everything. Not just, you know, a beat bag and a dirty and a sun. Everything. That's Krishna. Now, I don't recommend. <laughs> After this, they're going to say this first lecture was not the way to begin the, the, the festival of inspiration. We should have got something more inspiring. I don't recommend you go out and quit your occupation. That's not the idea. You know, you know, take a trip and forget about it. No. The idea is that if we have that kind of faith, we will see in our devotional service how Krishna provides everything. It's it's magical mystical, how he does that. Because Krishna likes to serve his devotees. He gets more pleasure out of serving his devotees than he does at accepting service from his devotees. That's Krishna. He illustrates that many times. He becomes the charioteer of his devotee in order to assist his devotee in devotional service. So Krishna loves to provide whatever the devotee wants. But the devotee doesn't ask anything for Krishna. He simply tries to serve the Lord by serving the spiritual master. And the spiritual master, when the spiritual master is pleased, because that's the essence of spiritual life, to please the spiritual master. Every day we sing, Yasya Prashada, Bhagavad Prashada, Yasya Prashada, Naguti Kutopi. That by pleasing the spiritual master, the path of devotional service is wide open. And if one doesn't, then no matter whatever else you do, it becomes a feature of difficulty. When the spiritual master is pleased, then the door to Krishna consciousness is wide open. And the spirit Prabhupada said, it's not very hard to please the spiritual master. What is the qualification for pleasing? 
sincere enthusiasm, yes, but sincere, sincere desire to follow the instructions. The sincere sincerity is the key to Krishna consciousness. Not qualifications. Material qualifications may be helpful, but they're not the feature of success. What success, what is success is a sincere desire to please the spiritual master. And that alone causes one to surrender to the Lord and to the, to the spiritual master. Um, Chaksudan Diloye Janmi Janmi Prabhu say that the spiritual master he comes with knowledge. Sometimes people ask, what are you Hare Krishna? Just the other day I was in the store and I was dressed like, like I always dressed. And one man came up to me and said, I, I, I'm also practicing spiritual life. What does your movement do to help people? Do you feed people? And all that? I said, well, we emphasize that the biggest problem in society is ignorance. Therefore, we are a knowledge-giving society. We're trying to teach people about the relationship with God and how to act in that relationship. So we give knowledge. That's our charity. That is the highest form of welfare. When somebody has knowledge, then they can solve their own problems. They can understand their direction in life. So the spiritual master, he's come with the torchlight of knowledge. And light, knowledge is like a light. It dissipates the darkness of ignorance. Ignorance is like darkness. And knowledge is like light. When the light comes, the darkness goes, the shadows disappear. And one can see oneself, one can see uh, one's relationship with the Lord, and one can understand how to act within that relationship. So that is the highest knowledge. He opens our eyes, and the spiritual master remains the spiritual master life after life after life. Our spiritual master is an eternal relationship. Some one time pro, someone asked Prabhupada, what happens if we don't make it back home in this life? Prabhupada said, then the spiritual master will have to come again and try to help you make it in the next life. But Prabhupada said, don't give your spiritual master any difficulties. <laughs> try to finish in this life. But he said that is the obligation of the spiritual master. As long as there is that contract, when one takes initiation, the agreement is, I will follow the instructions no matter what. The spiritual master said, I will take you back to Godhead. That is my service to Krishna. And whatever it takes to get you to come back to Godhead. So we have the story of Bilba Mangala Thakur. Beautiful story. How he was so attached to one prostitute named Chintamani. And how in the middle of a rainy, stormy night, he crossed the Ganges, climbed over her wall, her doors were locked, came in a very disheveled, uh, he, was full, he was completely beaten by the storm and by the travel. She was shocked. He was coming every night, but she thought, how? She closed her doors, not thinking that he would not come on this night. And she was so shocked, she said, if you have as much attachment for this body as you have for Krishna, your life would be perfect. And the words went right to his heart and became completely detached from the whole situation. But it's explained by the Acharyas that it wasn't her speaking. It was his spiritual master, Somagiri, from his last life, who used the prostitute to speak the words he needed to hear to break his attachment to material sense gratification. And he heard, he actually heard those words as being coming from his spiritual master. So the spiritual master is obligated to somehow or other bring the disciple back home, back to God in life after life. He fills my heart with transcendental knowledge. And Prabhupada explained, this is interesting. This is one of my favorite parts of this song. What is that transcendental knowledge? Prabhupada explains. He gives a little commentary on this in one, one talk. 
And he says, that knowledge is that you are Krishna's servant eternally. That is the knowledge. That that's who you are. You are nothing but a Krishna's servant eternally. That is the knowledge. He, he, he gives you that realization through the process of instructions that you are Krishna's servant. You can never be anything else but Krishna's servant. So that is what that line means. That transcendental knowledge is the Krishna's, your understanding of you being Krishna's servant. From him ecstatic prema emanates, by him ignorance is destroyed. The Vedic scriptures sing of his character. So throughout the Vedas, the spiritual master is glorified as the representative of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So one, we were hearing today in class, one should take full shelter of a devotee and become attached to a devotee. A pure devotee, not just a devotee, but attached to a pure devotee. So as become attached to the spiritual master, to Srila Prabhupada, to our spiritual master, then that attachment alone is a feature of success in our spiritual practice. Vaisheshika Prabhu used that nice example that, you know, if you want to get into a place and you're not qualified to get in, but if somebody else is in, that simply by being with that person you automatically get in. And so our connection with the spiritual master is the opportunity to, when we say, overcome the attach the difficulties of uh, material existence. He destroys ignorance. What is that ignorance? The ignorance is the basic principle of ignorance is we think we are this body. That is the basic principle of ignorance. We may theoretically understand I'm not this body, but in the day-to-day -day activity, we should practice this principle by detaching ourselves as much as we can to the bodily activities. Uh, not that one has to, um, you know, fast and sit under a tree and just chant all day. You can, you can do that, it's nice, but it's not what we say recommended. Better to preach, better to preach. But the idea is that this body is Krishna's property. It's not us. And it's meant to be used in the service of the Lord. So the spiritual master gives us that power to overcome the difficulties in our day-to-day -day life and struggling with the material energy. And Maya is very strong. Prabhupada used to criticize us. He said, you Westerners, you don't have a healthy fear of Maya. That was his criticism. He would say that you take Maya too cheaply, you take Maya so lightly. But Maya is Christian, Maya is a pure devotee. She's a pure devotee and she knows her service well. She knows how to, what we say, she knows exactly where you are vulnerable. She knows exactly where you need to work on your spiritual practice. Therefore, she always attacks you in that area. Why? To help you realize that that's where you're weak. And therefore, she gives you the realization by attracting you in that way, just to show you, or attacking you in that way, to show you where you need to work. That's Maya's mercy. She's a, she gives knowledge through her mercy, like that, to see where your weakness is. Um, and of course, the fundamental principle of practice of devotional service that gives us the strength to overcome Maya is two things. Association with devotees, Sadhu Sangha, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Sastri Hoy, Lava Mata, Sadhu Sangha, Sarva Siddhi Hoy. To associate with devotees and to hear, and also to chant the Hare Krishna Mahamantra. Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. 
there is no more powerful way to practice the spiritual life than to combine these two principles. Lord Chaitanya, in his uh, 48 years here, we carefully study his activities, we find that he emphasized two things. Vaishnav Seva, serving Vaishnavas, and chanting the holy names of the Lord. Out of the five potent process of devotional service, the chanting the holy name, serving Vaishnavas, hearing Srimad Bhagavatam, um, worshipping the Lord in the form of the deity, and living in a holy place, Lord Chaitanya put the emphasis on two, serving Vaishnavas and um, chanting the holy names of the Lord. This is the essence of the essence of devotional practice. And as that develops, then the third principle of Lord Chaitanya's movement comes into being, and that is Jiva Doya, to preach the message to others. So the last part of the song. Shiguru Chikara Kara Shiguru Karuna Siddhu Arabajanara Bandhu Lokanath Lokya Ajivan. Um, he is the friend of the poor. Who is the poor? Everyone's poor. What is the poverty? Lack of Krishna consciousness. That is the poverty. Um, he's the friend of the devotees. He gives mercy to all. Um, that next line is that uh, Naratam Dastakor is glorifying his spiritual master, Lokanath Swami. And the same way we also sing, Prabhupada Lokira Jivan. Haha Prabhu Koro Doya Deha Mori Padachaya. Begging, pleading, crying for the mercy. The spiritual master is merciful. He's the embodiment of Krishna's mercy, but we should cry and pray for the mercy anyway. It's, it, it'll come. Just like the rain. The rain comes, and, and it goes onto the rocks, it goes onto the water where the rain is not needed. Well, the spiritual master is the embodiment of Lord Chaitanya's mercy, and he's giving that mercy without qualification, but still, what makes the mercy become a greater part of our life is when we actually say, please give me the mercy. I'm begging. That's what this line means. You're merciful. I know that, but please give me your mercy. The more you want something that is re what you need, and you show that through your prayers, through your activities, the, more, then it, the faster that mercy is available. And the last line, um, your fame will spread throughout the three worlds. The spiritual master is famous. The pure devotee is famous. Why? Because he represents Krishna, the all-famous supreme personality of God. So the glories of the spiritual master are, what we say, as glorious as the glories of the Lord himself. Um, Sudhikirti describes how in his uh, relationship with spirit, with, with Prabhupada, he expressed to Prabhupada one time, Prabhupada, you know, I don't know so much about Krishna, but I'm really attached to you. You, to me, you are my Lord. Prabhupada said that is correct. That is proper. <laughs> Because how much we should be attached to Krishna, because the spiritual master is helping us to become attached to Krishna. But becoming attached to the spiritual master is synonymous with becoming attached to Krishna. And Krishna's mercy is fully embodied in the spiritual master. It's described that um, that the spiritual master, if he wants to give mercy to someone who may not be qualified. And because he, Krishna, is duty-bound by love, not love-bound, to fulfill the desires of the spiritual master, even though Krishna might think, this person, who is he? He's not unqualified. So to get Krishna's mercy is not easy. Mercy through the spiritual master 
That is the way to get Krishna's mercy. So the spiritual master is more merciful than Krishna. How is it possible? That's Krishna's way of glorifying his pure devotee. He wants the spiritual master to be his representative for giving out his mercy. So I went quickly through this prayer because I know we didn't have too much time. And um, we can speak some more, but I was thinking we can ask questions. If there's any discussion or questions, on, we can make this question and answer session based on the idea of guru-disciple relationship. Because there's so much to this process of guru-disciple relationship that needs to be explained and understood in a deeper way. What it means to be a disciple. What it means to serve the spiritual master. And for those who haven't taken that step in spiritual life, it is required. It is required to take shelter of the spiritual master. Rupa Goswami explains that out of the 64 items of devotional service that's mentioned, written in the uh, Bhakti Rasamrita Sindhu, Nectar of Devotion, the first and most important principle is Guru Asraya, to take shelter of Krishna's representative. The second is to um, take initiation, and the third is to inquire regularly how to make advancement in spiritual life, to follow his instructions and to inquire how to make advancement. Is there any questions, comments, on any, anything about the tattva, the, the relationship between guru and disciple? Yes, Mother Hari. so many times before, but I think it helps sometimes to clarify what that surrender means, because sometimes people want to take a guru, but they become afraid. They look at the history and they think, does that mean that I give up my discrimination? Does that mean if someone asks me to do something that, you know, the guru, like you were saying, Prabhupada said, I know Krishna and I know what Krishna is guiding me to do. Is it absolutely that every word that comes out of a person's mouth that's not directly scripture, which we know is perfect, that we don't have any position to say with all due respect, or you know what I'm asking. Is the spiritual master wrong by his right? Is that the one? Yeah. You know, in, in other words, you know, once one has accepted that oh. position as a disciple of a yeah. guru with everything we're hearing, mm. does that mean that we don't have to think anymore and we just, whatever is spoken, no, no. we accept? But Prabhupada said we should become independently intelligent. To use your intelligence, how to execute devotional service. And that's what it means to be a disciple. Blind following and what we say, what's the other aspect? Uh, you know, just questioning everything is, is rejected. One has to ultimately ask relevant questions on how to make advancement and also if one is not clear, sure of an instruction, or the instruction may not seem to be, what we say, in line with the, the spiritual principles, one should question it. One could, one could question it. Prabhupada wanted independent thinkers. He didn't want just a bunch of blind followers. People to use their intelligence on how to take his instructions and apply it in their life in a practical way. And that's the process. Um, and therefore, one can come back to the spiritual master and ask how to do it. But if one understands it, then one can go ahead and execute it. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, we have to have intelligence also. Yes, sir. Marat, uh, you said like one should attach to pure devotee spiritual master. So I wanted to know like, how do we develop attachment for spiritual master, the love and the faith? How do we develop that love and the faith? Yeah, attachment. To the spiritual master. Assuming one has a spiritual master already, and then you're trying to develop that, or you're trying to yeah. awaken that attachment to someone who will recover its spiritual master. I have a 
Okay. Um, Bani. Bani means instructions. By in following the instructions of the spiritual master, one develops a relationship. It's all based on following instructions. Associate, physical association is called Mapu. That is two aspects of one's relationship with the spiritual master, body and vapu. Vapu can endear one to the spiritual master where the instructions become more, what we say, inspired to follow. But without taking that step into deeply absorbing oneself in the instructions, if body is not enough, we have the instructions of the spiritual master of the life and soul of the spirit of the disciple. Because Prabhupada used to say, actually, um, it was Malati. Malati wrote Prabhupada a letter, I think it was back in 1968, 1667, something around that time. Wherein she was she was doing personal cooking for Prabhupada. And then Prabhupada had to go somewhere, so they were separated for some time. So what, Malati wrote Prabhupada a letter, a very affectionate letter. She was really missing his association. And Prabhupada acknowledged that, but then he said, the association of the spiritual master is based on the instructions of the spiritual master. The spiritual master is not the body. He used that word. The spiritual master is the feature of devotional service to Krishna. So if you're engaged in devotional service, you're connected, you're associated. It's based on service, sincere service. So, Prabhupada would also say, you're chanting Hare Krishna, and I'm chanting Hare Krishna. We're together <coughs> on the spiritual plan. Materially, together is seen in terms of physical uh, association. But on the spiritual platform, um, there's no separation as long as one is engaged in devotional service, following the instructions. And that has to be realized through the process. I'm explaining the principle, but without that, without that practice, we can't realize that, that the spirit. And we see even today, the devotees who have no, have never had association with Prabhupada, somehow missed that opportunity because they're engaged in devotional service. They feel Prabhupada's presence. They have a genuine affection for Prabhupada, even though they maybe, maybe never had that physical association. So, that's the principle. Yes? Thank you, Marsh. Can you talk a bit about the prerequisite one needs um, before taking on Guru and, and also um, the choosing process? What what considerations should one make in choosing a spiritual master? Yeah. I'll tell you what you shouldn't do. Um, the problem is, you know, what, one should not be attracted so much to, you know, the external feature of the spiritual master. You know, what does he look like or what is, you know, what is he, you know, one should be inspired by the words of the spiritual master that helps one surrender. We can get we can get inspired by a lot of things, and by a lot of people can inspire us. But the inspiration we're looking for is that inspiration that we want to give our life to. That's the inspiration we're looking for. Someone we can give our life to, are willing to do whatever is required. So we should look for that inspiration when we're hearing, looking for a spiritual master. Like this person I, I will be able to give my life to completely. And Krishna well, will direct you. It says that when the person is ready, when the living entity is ready, Krishna within the heart directs that living entity to a guru. When he sees that that person is ready, he points to the direction very clearly to that person, and then you have to recognize that. So, what does it mean to be ready? And that to take initiation, 
means to ultimately to, you know, engage in devotional service. That is the process. We shouldn't consider anything else foremost. Devotional service is our life and so on. When we're ready to put devotional service as the most important thing in our life, then we might say we're ready to take that step. And it's a necessary step. Uh, there are nine processes of devotional service. Uh, Adalstrata, Sadhu Sangha, Bhajana Kriya. The third step is Bhajana Kriya, which, which means to take shelter of a spiritual master. And then an art of nirvriti, getting rid of unwanted desires, nishta, steadiness, ruchi, taste, ashakti, attachment to Krishna, bhava, affection for Krishna, and then ultimately prema. So the third stage of the nine processes of bhakti is to take shelter of a spiritual master. We won't get to the other stages unless we make that step. So it is essential. But keep your heart open, keep your ears open, and listen for that voice that inspires you. It's the vakya, the words of the spiritual master. Yes, someone else had a hand up over here. Yes, Mataji. Spiritual sentiment is nice, but if it's material, uh, actual, it's good to be, to have sentiment, but when the sentiment has to be based on what we say, knowledge. It has to be based on knowledge, not based on just how I feel, or what inspires me externally. It has to be based on knowledge. And therefore we have scripture to teach us what is the basis of that relationship. There are certain things we have to avoid in our relationship with the spiritual master that are contrary to that relationship, such as developing an over-familiarity with the spiritual master. In, you know, hey, Guru Maharaj, how you doing today? <laughs> How's it going? You know, you know, are you getting enough rest? You know? and, uh, I mean, the spiritual master will think, well, you know, and, uh, and we should develop affection for the spiritual master, because he's the connection between Krishna. As we develop our affection for, for, the, uh, for the spiritual master, we're also developing our affection for Krishna. It's not that we just want to love Krishna and the spiritual master, he's just like, you know, something neutral in the middle that helps us. No, I actually develop <coughs> real love and affection for the spiritual master. But it shouldn't be, it should be based on service. How to please, how to please, that's it. It's, it's really quite simple when you get right down to it. <laughs> when you think about it, it's just simple, how to please, that's it. You love someone, you want to please them. And the, but it's not always easy to please the spiritual master because he's giving us things that we don't want. We don't want to get rid of our attachments, but he's... So therefore, when he sees you're giving up your attachments and becoming more enthusiastic in your service, that's pleasing. You're becoming a nice devotee, that's pleasing. Love means to please. When you love someone, you want to please them. You can give the spiritual master gifts. You can give the spiritual master nice words of praise. And we might say that's, that's necessary or that's part of the process, but that's not really what pleases the spiritual master. What pleases it is the sincere desire to serve and to surrender. That's what pleases the most. And it doesn't matter, little service, big service, service. There's a question here. How do you feel if someone's 
somebody has a sincere desire for an organization, and if he sees a uh, lot of uh, you know, others in addressing the situation, because the uh, situation is with elders and seniors in the organization, should that person, uh, how, how, the, how should the person address the situation? Should he keep quiet? Should he tell them? Or <coughs> If there's something in your that's causing you some doubt, you should inquire, discuss it, bring out it, bring it out, and then understand it. If you take a step that is a commitment, and you do that simply because you should do it, but still you have doubts, those doubts will come back again later. So you always get your doubts cleared up before you move. That's why our process is to questions and answers, not just, you know, it's not just one way. What is it? Papa um, said we should discuss this philosophy, this process. Threadbare, that means to the essence. And if there's something that is disturbing or un unclear, then ask questions. And if it's still continuing disturbing to rise, step up. Mm -hmm. What causes that to continue? The lack of satisfy satisfactory answers? Uh, yeah, lot of unsatisfactory answers, and I see the thing, the direction is not right, mm -hmm. and it's stopping the growth. Well, if you can make a difference, that's good. If something is off. You don't want to be a part of that. Or if you can correct it to make it better, then that's good. But if you can't correct it, then, you know, stay away from it. And focus on the essence. I mean, our society is a worldwide society, and there's a lot of things going on. And there's a lot of stuff that is just quite questionable sometimes, in terms of, you know, how things are done. But you can always find somewhere where you can surrender. Yes? Krishna fulfills all desires. I'm scared of Vaishnava. You're scared of what? Vaishnava. Vaishnava? Aparad. 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 How can you... Like, you should be. <laughs> <laughs> I am too. At the same time, I care about this. So, it's like... How can you be... What, is, what makes something an Aparad is when we are accusing or criticizing or fault-finding or blaspheming or, you know, presenting our position as the right one. But if we're inquiring in a humble way, trying to understand in an intelligent way, that's not offensive. That's not offensive. It's a matter, it's the mood. If we're saying, well, you're a rascal and I know you are. Oh, that's not very you know, humble. <laughs> but if you think, uh, sir, I th think you're a rascal. <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> but this way, this is the way it, I see it. <laughs> so can you help me <laughs> understand a little clearer just how right or wrong I am? <laughs> Less, you know, direct. You know. I think it's it's Vaishnav etiquette. We have to be sensitive to the fact that Vaishnavas are very special. But at the same time, we're not blind followers. If something is not, something doesn't make sense, we have to try to understand it deeply, deeper. Now, there are certain things you'll never understand. Like it says that when two senior Vaishnavas seem to disagree and have some argument. If you take the side of one or the other, then you're finished. Because you, they, they may have some leela going on that you don't understand. So, but if there's something in the process that doesn't allow you to take the step forward to engage in the process, then you want to know what that is, how to clear that up. What do I have to do to become a devotee? Where can I surrender? The point is that if we have sincere desire, Krishna will help you. 
He'll, he'll direct you, not only help you, he'll show you exactly where you need to go, under how to understand things. But we should always keep the etiquette. That's important. Yes, uh, Jai Nanda Prabhu. What are the prevalent pitfalls that you've seen when disciples, spiritual master, passed over to the they're not on the planet? What are the prevalent pitfalls that you've seen that have ended up stagnating a disciple's spiritual life? And uh, what can we do to uh, see that, like, acknowledge it, and, and help those people? The biggest thing that I see, and this happened when Srila Prabhupada left also, is that people were so attached to the personal association that when the spiritual master left, it was too much for them to continue in the same way. And therefore they lost their enthusiasm because they were so much, what we say, inspired by the personal association. But the spiritual master teaches through a personal association that more important is his instruction. And now the spiritual master leaves sometimes in order to help the sub devotee, serious devotees go forward. When, ser when the spiritual master leaves, those who are serious, they make nice advancement because they serve the spiritual master in separation. And that's more difficult. But that's required. So I think the biggest thing is that we get so much attached to the physical association. And uh, when the spiritual master leaves, uh, we can adjust. There may, there should, there is some lamentation, there is some feeling of loss. But one has to ultimately, ultimately understand to really, to please my spiritual master, I should become more determined to follow his instructions and become a better devotee. Therefore, in order to keep that spirit alive, devotees should meet and discuss amongst themselves how to follow the instructions of their departed spiritual master, to inspire each other, sadhu sangha. That's the thing I see the most. As soon as the guru goes, uh, leaves, and then many, some fall away. In some case, many do. It's a problem. Yes, Chaitanya. Say someone's uh, serving senior Vaishnavas, Chaitanya mm -hmm. Hare Krishna. He said it's required, absolutely required, for some to accept the spiritual master. So. What, why, what it, why do they, why is that required? I missed something. It's like, is there a reason, say someone's following Krishna consciousness, basically they're chanting, oh. they're serving devotees. Mm -hmm. So what is it about serving, accepting, why is it they need to definitely accept the spiritual master? If they're chanting Hare Krishna and they're serving devotees and they're engage in devotional service, why should they accept the spiritual yeah. master? Tat vigyartam guru eva abhigatshche. Prabhupada used to quote this, quote this a lot. Abhigatshche, Prabhupada said, is not a small word. It means must. One must accept the shelter of a bona fide spiritual master and work under his direction. So from the fact, practical and philosophical aspect of, is that um, unless one adheres themselves to the instructions of the, the Lord coming through the spiritual master in due course of time, it will be hard to maintain that, that chanting, that serving, because the process of, is the process of purification. And as we engage, we're becoming purified. And becoming purified means losing our attachments. So unless we're very carefully connected to the spiritual master who can guide us through these different things, um, then it becomes hard to continue on devotional service. It's not only the process, but it's also the feature of what we say, staying in the process. Maya is too strong. Without that guidance, it becomes very difficult. 
And that's their connection. You're connected to Krishna through the spiritual master. You become part of the spiritual family through the process of accepting a spiritual master. Initiation is in the heart. Real initiation comes in the heart. The formal ceremony consummates what's really in the heart. That is, if you're not, if you haven't made that, um, that vow within your heart, then even if you take the formal initiation, you're really not initiated. And Prabhupada said that one time. One man took initiation from Prabhupada, and the next day he left. The next day. And one devotee asked Prabhupada, he just left the next day. Prabhupada said he was never initiated. He didn't make that vow within one's heart. Or why would he leave? So, and the process of initiation is the process of ongoing. It's not that we just become initiation and, okay, I got a guru, I go, oh, I'm fixed, I can go back to Godhead, I don't have to do anything. Guru does everything, yes, yeah, he pulls me back, I can sleep on the chariot. <laughs> Guru's mercy is great, but uh, still, you have to <laughs> you have to be you have to want it. <laughs> yes, uh, Rasika Nanda Prabhu. Yes. Uh, you were just with the analogy that the devotee he left and then he didn't come back. So sometimes our attachments they take us away from our practice of Krishna consciousness. So how to understand? You know, like <laughs> it says, you know, the offense against chanting is to disobey the orders of the spiritual master. So those offenses keep us from being able to get the mercy of the holy name, which brings us back in line with the orders of the spiritual master. So I'm wondering how it is that, you know, the attachments can be purified at the same time. Uh, the, pro <laughs> the, the, the the attachment takes us away and makes us commit offenses, which keep us from being able to properly practice, which seems kind of self defeating. I don't know. How to avoid that? Yeah. How to basically. avoid the attachments from uh, association. If you stay in the association of devotees, you'll get purified, whether you like it or not. <laughs> <laughs> you have to. That's the, that's the remedy for, you know, whatever problems you're having, because Krishna will reveal exactly what you need to do through the association of the bodies. So even if you're struggling with that material attachment, and it's taking, stay in the association of the bodies, and through the association of the bodies, then you get the inspiration, and you also get the desire to give up these attachments. You inspired. We need sadhu sanghas, this is the most powerful, the so powerful. Actually, it's the feature of everything. Even we might say that chanting Hare Krishna is the essence of the essence, yes. But when it's performed in the association of devotees, then it really develops in our life. Kirtan, japa, hearing about the glories of the Lord, all it's association of devotees. That's where our, our strength lies. There's another question. Yes, sir. You said uh, it implies it's a multi-life contract with the, with the guru. So does that mean before you find the guru, you have to find what the previous life you had with the guru? Yeah, if you had a spiritual master in your next and your previous life, yeah. Then I don't know if you can, <laughs> but the relationship with the spiritual master is eternal, and he comes, he comes in different ways to reclaim you. He may come as in, in another person, but that, that, is, that is his feature of mercy, coming in that form of that person, will again connect you back to, this, to him, to the devotional service. You'll find that out when you go back to Godhead. <laughs> He'll be there to greet you and warmly welcome you. Now you know who I am. 
but you really didn't forget. It's just like something that is there. Yes, Are there any um, sentiments or practices that should be reserved for Maha Bhagwa? as opposed to all those spiritual masters that follow him? You mean his practice? Like a certain type of worship of the... <coughs> what we understand as worshiping the guru is worshiping Sri Lanka. Right. And those certain sentiments and attitudes and understandings of the spiritual master are around Prabhupada. He is Mahabhava. He is a Mahabhava. Yeah. So do we understand all the spiritual um, we have a direct relationship with Prabhupada because Prabhupada is the founder of Jarya of the Iskan Society. So anyone who comes in this, into this movement and has a direct connection with Prabhupada. But it's, it's direct through our, our spiritual master because the spiritual masters are the representatives of Srila Prabhupada. So we learn about Prabhupada through our spiritual master. Therefore, it's direct and indirect simultaneously. Um, but it's all based on him following the instructions, hearing from Srila Prabhupada by reading his books, by hearing his tapes, by awakening our attachment to the process of devotional service. The process itself connects us with the personality. The deeper we go into the process, the more we feel connected with the spiritual master, with our own spiritual master, with Srila Prabhupada, with Bhakti Siddhanta, with Bhakti Vinod, it goes, it connects us deeper and deeper as we go deeper into the process. So it's all based on our own spirit, the strength of our own spiritual life. But we should hear from Prabhupada regularly. That's important. We should also hear from our own spiritual master. That's essential. But we also have to hear from Prabhupada. Prabhupada wanted that. Because his, this is his movement. He said, my books will be the law books for the next 10,000 years. So whatever philosophy and practice that we follow is coming from Prabhupada. And so therefore, Prabhupada remains foremost in our practice, his teachings, everything. In everything. So, um, is that answer your question? Yeah, like this prayer, do we, is this prayer meant reserved for Sri Lankapad, or is this prayer a prayer that we pray to our spiritual master? Both for you. You get two spiritual masters. <laughs> <laughs> for us, it's Prabhupada. For those who, yeah, because Guru is one. The Guru comes in many forms to teach the same message. But Prabhupada's unique in the sense that he is the founder of Acharya. And he's been specially empowered by the Lord to spread Krishna consciousness. In the sense that he was mentioned in scripture, Prabhupada's mentioned in the Lochandas uh, Thakur's, uh, what is it, um, Chaitanya, Mangala. One great personality will come and in the future and will take Lord Chaitanya's movement and will take it around the world. He will be known as the Sanapati Bhakta, which means the general amongst Bhaktas. And so that prediction is already there in the scriptures. So Prabhupada is, is, is a self apologetic unique personality. So we keep Prabhupada deep within our heart, but then again, we shouldn't have any lesser affection for our spiritual master, because actually in one sense, he's representing Prabhupada. So he's giving us Prabhupada through his instructions and through his teachings, and my, his life example. So in one sense, they're simultaneously one and different. Is that okay? So if, when you're chanting this prayer, if you're meditating or thinking of either one, that's fine. Or both. Uh, let's see, Mataji. Which book is it predicted? Prabhupada is a Sanapati Bhakta. Sanapati? Yeah, Sanapati. Yeah, yeah. That's in Chaitanya Mangala. 
by Lord Chant Thakur, which was the first biography written about the life of Lord Chaitanya. And it's been written by Lord, uh, Lokanath Maharaj. He's written about that in, our, in his writings. And other devotees have also written about that. We should revive Prabhupada's spirit. We just, we were in a meeting, it was a meeting of um, spiritual masters, and the idea was what can we do as spiritual masters to increase our. And one thing that came out really strongly is Prabhupada consciousness. We need to bring that stronger back into our society. With, as time goes on, it can, it can naturally just become less and less prominent just because of the time factor. And at the same time, um, you know, it's just like many people who are coming into our movement or just gaining, they really don't know much about them. And it's essential because really, if you're going to follow a process, you should know the person who gave you the process. I mean, deeply. Who is Shiva Prabhupada? And, and from my own experience, I can honestly say that I don't know who Prabhupada is. I'm learning every year more and more about who this personality is. So we should keep that spirit alive. How can we do that? Read Prabhupada's books, read the Leela Amrita, read books about Prabhupada, speak about Prabhupada. Prabhupada said, I'm in my books. He said, when someone asked him, Prabhupada, Prabhupada, when you leave, how will we associate? Prabhupada said, I'm in my books. You read my books. You read my books, you can associate with me directly. And it's a fact. If we have that mood when we're reading, Prabhupada will talk to you. <laughs> the words will be spoken by Prabhupada. They'll come right, right into your heart. And that's, that's association with Prabhupada. So in terms of the Guru Puja, yes, we lose that enthusiasm, but we shouldn't. See, the thing is, why do we lose that enthusiasm? Because we do the same thing every day and we think, ah, oh, what's new? We get in this what's new consciousness, which is material. In the material world, in order for people to be happy, they have to keep changing. Otherwise, they can't continue with their life. But in spiritual life, we take what's given and we just go deeper into what it is, and then it reveals itself more. The holy name, association with devotees, the, the books, the worship. It's unlimitedly sweet, unlimitedly mm, deep in philosophical teachings. So we shouldn't get this mentality, well, you know, here we go again. We're doing the same thing every day. Very well. That is material. Oh, and someone else. Okay, yes. I'll come back to you. Yes. It's 102. Should we stop for Rupa Prashad? I'll keep talking, and whoever wants to go for Prashad, you can go. <laughs> So uh, feel free to leave if you'd like to go for to take prasad. Yes, sir. Yeah, for Maharaj, um, back to developing relationship and attachment for spiritual master. So the case where if we don't have an opportunity to serve physical physical service to spiritual master or physical association, and so what are the factors that comes into developing relationship and attachment? One of the factors that help us develop attachment for finding a spiritual master? Yeah, well, physical association or opportunity to serve physically to Guru Maharaj. Hearing. You have to keep hearing. And nowadays, we have everyone, every person who is more or less in a position to give shelter has tapes like that. You can always get recorded tapes and just hear it. That's practical. For those who are leaving, thank you very much. Thank you.
How do you know that one of Why don't you have personal association? Because <laughs> you don't want them. <laughs> How do you know if you want to, you can get it. <laughs> and if you, if it's, even if it's hard, you can somehow or other do that. It's, a ba it's based on desire. Yeah, but being in material world, <coughs> sense attachment, so it's very hard to come over on that. Both theoretical we may think, but in practical it's very, seems to be hard to... I still say it's based on desire. Based on desire. So if we are still following instructions and, and following everything... You're associating. But it's important, if your spiritual master is still here, it's, be, it's, it's important to get his association from time to time. You need that. You need that. If you say, well, I have, I have so much service, I have to, that's nice. But if you want to continue to be enthusiastic in your service, it's nice to get personal association if you want to. It, it, it endears us closer to the spiritual master. So we should take advantage of that. Yes. Yes, you have any recommendations for the ability to the spiritual master has left the planet before they took initiation? Who took initiation within their heart but never took the formal one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a practically test to that, yeah. I was involved with something that is exactly like that, yeah. That is their spiritual master, the one that left, but still they have to get initiated. And that guru has to understand that that other person is her, his or her real spiritual master, and although he's teaching that person, he's helping her or him connect with that person. That was a situation, we had that situation with Sridhar Swami. One lady, she developed really attachment to Sridhar Maharaj, but then he left before she took initiation. And she couldn't, although she was following others, you know, still she gave her heart to Sridhar Swami. And then that spiritual master who gave her initiation actually understood clearly that that's her guru, and therefore he's helping in her in that way as he gives her instructions. Yeah? Yes, Maharaj, uh, like, uh, first of all, thank you very much for connecting us better to our spiritual master. Uh, question is that we hear many devotees along with our spiritual master and we feel inspired by hearing others also. So how do we connect it to our own spiritual master? Yeah, that's called shiksha. If what another spiritual master or anyone is saying should not be contrary or in opposition to what your spiritual master is teaching. If it is, you have to accept what your spiritual master teaches. Diksha and Shiksha are equal, but when there's a contradiction, you take Diksha. That's mentioned, Sridhar, I'm sorry, Shiva Maharaj wrote that book, Shiksha Guru, a little pamphlet, where he explains that and quote Shastra on that, that one can get relevant instructions from others, and that is also recommended, especially in our society, when we don't have physical proximity. But at the same time, if there apparently is some contradiction, then one should present that doubt, contradiction, questing to their question to their spiritual master and get, and for clarification and accept whatever they say. And that happens sometimes. You know, sometimes devotees, they want an answer to a question and they go to so many people until they find the answer they want. There you go. It's called, uh, uh, what is it called? I forgot. It's called, uh, Submissive inquiry. <laughs> Almost. Um, this is a feature of counseling. If you're already initiated, 
there's where you get your strength, that's where you get your clarified instructions. Yes. You want a follow-up question? Yes. Yeah. Like, uh, not, on, not in, especially in this circumstance where there is contradiction, but we may feel also that other sannyasis or devotees are, in, we feel inspired by them. Uh -huh. So then, Good. sometimes there is comparison, this material, then how do we... This is a family, and you'll find that there's differences in personality, differences in ways of presenting the philosophy, so many differences. That's nice. You can, what we say, be inspired by a variety of ways, and by a variety of devotees, that's nice. But long, but when it comes to contradiction, then you have to get clarification. You should hear from as many persons as you can. It's nice. process of bhakti, one is making advancement. At a certain stage of advancement, through the process of bhakti, one is awakening their internal relationship with Krishna. It's going on. Our internal, our, our soul is becoming more and more revealed in its natural relationship with Krishna through the process of bhakti. When, at a certain stage, when, this, when the disciple is ready, Prabhupada said, the spiritual master comes and teaches the disciple what is their relationship with Krishna in the spiritual world. Uh, one doesn't have to go to another guru to find out what is their, how we say, uh, siddha pranali, and their uh, eternal relationship with Krishna. Mm -hmm. But how it's reflected in our relationship with the spiritual master, I don't know how you could get away from being sahajya superimposing something artificial if you try to try to understand that. Our whole process of guru disciple relationship is just basically to follow the instructions. And as we follow the instructions we develop attachment for Krishna, we develop attachment for our spiritual master. And the spiritual master will reveal when you're ready who you are. 